Hey guys, welcome to the first video of my series on Dragon Age Origins. It's 2022 and I think this is the perfect time to play this brand new game. <laughs> I am of course kidding. The, the game came out in 2009 and the only reason that doesn't make me feel very, very old is that I think I first played this game back in... 2013, 2014, so I still feel old, but not quite as much. I am. <laughs> I I guess that's a roundabout way to say that I have played this game before. I have even finished it. I finished it, I think it was just the one time. Uh, but I do remember having a lot of fun with this game. I enjoyed it a lot, and... When I wanted to play this game again, I thought that this time I wanted to share it with all of you. The way that I plan to play this game is to really put the role play into the role play game, role playing game tag. I want to play this game as my character, as the character that I'm going to create. I want to do this for two reasons. I think that it'll be an interesting way to play the game for one. You know, to make the choices that I feel would benefit that character, that that character would make. And the second reason is it will hopefully keep me metagaming less. It'll hopefully keep it to the minimum because that's not the way that I want to play this game. So, you know, might not get the good ending. We'll see. Uh, I think that's really all I want to say before I start. The next step is obviously to create the character world, join in this brand new game. I hope you guys will, will you know, join me on my adventure. Join me in Thedas. So, let's start. Dragon Age Origins. And so is the, and so is the Golden City Blackened with each step you take in my hall. Marvel at perfection, for it is fleeting. You have brought sin to heaven, and doom upon all the world. Canticle of Threnodes, 8.13 The Chantry teaches us that it is the hubris of men which brought the Darkspawn into our world. The mages had sought to usurp heaven, but instead they destroyed it. They were cast out, twisted and cursed by their own corruption. They returned as monsters, the first of the Darkspawn. They became a blight upon the lands, unstoppable and relentless. The Dwarven Kingdoms were the first to fall, and from the deep roads, the Dark Spawn drove at us again and again, until finally we neared annihilation. came. Men and women from every race, warriors and mages, barbarians and kings, the Grey Wardens sacrificed everything to stem the tide of darkness and prevail. been four centuries since that victory and we have kept our vigil 
We have watched and waited for the Darkspawn to return. But those who once called us heroes have forgotten. We are few now, and our warnings have been ignored for too long. seen with my own eyes what lies on the horizon. Maker, help us all. Ooh, sorry, I, I don't think I talked to Audra in that cutscene, but I really think that it's a great cutscene. It gets you so in the mood to play the game, and I am now pumped to create our character. Which I guess is why it's there. The background you select will determine which of six distinct opening stories you play through. It also affects how characters respond to you throughout the game. Let's get started. So gender. Male and female. Men and women in Ferelden are generally regarded as equals. Both genders are evenly represented in most organisations noble houses and military forces. I have absolutely nothing against playing as a male, but uh, if I have that chance, I'm gonna go female. <laughs> then we've got the races, so we've got human. The most numerous yet the most divided of all the races. Only four times have they ever united under a single cause, the last being centuries ago. Religion and the Chantry play a large part in human society. It distinguishes them cu culturally from elves and dwarves more than anything else. Humans can be warriors, rogues, or mages. I do not think I said culturally. <laughs> I don't think I said it right, but we're moving on to elves. Once enslaved by humans, most elves have all but lost their culture. Scrounging in impoverished living, scrounging an impoverished living in the slums of human cities, only the nomadic Dalish tribes still cling to their traditions, living by the bow and the rule of their old gods, as they roam the ancient forests, welcome nowhere else. Elves can be warriors, mages or rogues. And then we've got the dwarves, rigidly bound by caste and tradition, the dwarves have been waging a losing war for generations, trying to protect the last stronghold of their once vast underground empire from the Darkspawn. Dwarves are very tough and have a high resistance to all forms of magic, thus preventing them from becoming mages. So we have the races and then we choose the class and then the classes depend which origin that you choose. So um, let's have a look at the classes. So we've got warriors. Warriors are powerful fighters, focusing on melee and ranged weapons to, to deal with their foes. They can withstand and deliver a great deal of punishment and have a strong understanding of tactics and strategy. Specializations for a warrior include berserker, templar, champion and reaver. And then the mages. The mages are as dangerous. Mage. Let me start again. As dangerous as it is potent, magic is a curse for those lacking the will to wield it. Malevolent spirits that wish to enter the world of the living are drawn to mages like beacons, putting the mage and everyone nearby in constant danger. Because of this, mages lead lives of isolation, locked away from the world they threaten. Specializations include Spirit Healer, Shapeshifter, Arcane Warrior, and Blood Mage. And then the Rogue. Rogues are skilled adventurers who come from all walks of life. All rogues possess some skill in picking locks and spotting traps, making them valuable assets to any party. Tactically, they are not ideal frontline fighters, but if rogues can circle around behind their target, they can backstab to devastating effect. 
rogue specialization are ranger, bard, duelist, and assassin. So, if I went for a human and I chose either a rogue or a warrior, I can choose the background noble, human noble, born to wealth and power second only to royalty. You find your training in both diplomacy and battle put to the test as your brother leads both of your family's forces to war in the south. I'm not gonna lie, I'm probably not gonna go for humans. I find them awfully dull when you can play other species in games. You know, they're the general go-to man. So let's go to elves. And if we choose warrior or rogue, we get two backgrounds to choose from. We've got the dealer shelf. Proud of your role as one of the few true elves, you have always assumed you would spend your life with your tribe until a chance encounter with a relic of your people's past threatened to, threatened to tear you away from everything you have ever known. And then City Elf. Complete opposite to the Daily Shelf, you have always lived under the heavy thumb of your human overlords. But when a local lord claiming his privilege with pride Shatters your wedding day. The simmering racial tensions explode in a rain of vengeance. I'm not going to lie. I hate that it's overlord. Human overlord. Then again, would master be any better? And then, if you choose either an elf or a human, you can also choose the mag magi background. Wielding a power as dangerous as it is potent. You know that magic is a curse for those lacking the will to control it. You anxiously await your harrowing, the one chance to prove yourself against the demons lurking without and within. Succeed or be slaughtered by the knights who warred against your kind. This is one that I enjoy playing, but that is the one origin that I played all the way through to the end. So I'm probably going to avoid the Medjai background on this playthrough, but we've got two more backgrounds to look at. We've got the Dwarven backgrounds, and as they stated before, you can't be a mage as a Dwarf. You can only be a warrior or a rogue. So we've got the Dwarf Noble. As the favoured child of the Dwarven King, you proudly take, your, take up your first military command only to learn that the deadly intrigues of family and sycophants may pose a greater danger than even the battlefield. And then the last and final background is the one that I'm going to be playing today because who doesn't love an underdog story and that is the Dwarf Commoner. Born castless in a land where rank is everything, bound as a lackey and thug of a local crime lord, you have spent your life invisible until chance thrusts you into the spotlight where you can finally prove whether you will be defined by your actions or your birth. So yeah, we're playing the Dwarf Commoner today. And as much as I do enjoy playing the Rogue, this Lackey and Thug is going Warrior. Because who doesn't like hitting people in the head with a massive, massive sword, especially when you're a dwarf, so you're that much shorter. Greetings. Okay, and now we get to watch me struggle through the uh, the creating the character. I probably won't go too in depth because otherwise I'd be looking at her on the side and I'd be like, five minutes in, she's ugly. I can't stand looking at her for the next 30, 50 hours. No, thank you. Some of these noses are just a bit sticky out there, aren't they? And I, I know I said that I wouldn't like imperfections, but I kind of love this one because it looks like she's got a dint in her forehead, like what is going on there? And I like to imagine that it's because she's been, she's been, you know, in too many fights. She likes hitting people in the head. Sometimes they hit her back in the head. And now she's got a dint 
in the forehead and people look at her from the side and they're like what's wrong with your face and then she hits them in the head because why would you say that to her uh, skin complexion i think that just affects how old she looks she's the old crone from the dwarven district no i don't think so let's go let's go to the normal skin do i want to go nope uh how much makeup does she have on i don't like no 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 not much makeup at least bring the intensity right down right down and then of course because she's castless she has to have a tattoo but We'll see what the other tattoos look like, see if they look any better. I think we'll just go for the simple one. Uh, let's, let's make it a bit less intense, because she's had it since she's a little girl. And, you know, that looked a bit too... I had got this five days ago while I was drunk in a bar. There we go. Uh, what does her hair look like? I did actually like that hairstyle. Although not from the back. Why has she got three three pigtails? That makes no sense whatsoever. Mm, I don't want her looking too neat. But I also don't want her looking like she's not brushed her hair in five years. Like I think there's one specific one that looks like that. Oh, speaking of the one that looks like that, it's like, really? I know you don't have a comb, but you have fingers, right? Um, if that was tied off at the back, it'd look nice, but it looks a bit weird like that. Yeah, let's have a hair pulled back. She looks semi-professional. And that's perfectly semi-professional, you know? Not all of it, she's got a teeny tiny bit of a bit of a fringe on top. I don't know whether that could be classed as a fringe. Let's look at hair. We are probably gonna go brown, brunette, boring, boring colours, but uh, that looks better. Doesn't look like it quite matches, but I don't think any of them quite match. Maybe that one. She looks like she could pluck the eyebrows, but uh, I don't think she she really cares that much about about her eyebrows or makeup or things like that. Too busy looking for the next fight. Let's look at the eye shape. Um, I like this one at the end, she looks tired. She looks like she's seen too much. She's seen things you can't even imagine. Uh, I'm not even gonna attempt to touch like the spacing and the height, but we'll look at colour. See what colours we can do with. Yes, any good ones? Uh, let's go hazel. Not quite green, bit of brown, yes. I'm not going to touch that nose. I love that nose. It's big and it's buttony. Let's look at the mouth. Mouth in a good position. Is it a good size? Do we want a bit smaller? A bit smaller. A bit smaller. don't think I'm going to attempt to touch that cause anything goes wrong and well, we'll have a look. Yeah, it doesn't look nice. Something I need to look at this side, but... Okay, okay, that's, that's enough. Let's go down to the portrait. Let's make it less boring gonna be staring at the camera the distance oh close 
Uh, I wanted it to be further away than that. I wanted it to be like a speck in the distance. Instead, we'll go uncomfortably close. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. There we go. <laughs> Do we have an expression? Yeah, she's she's snarling in a picture. She's like, Why are you taking a picture of me? They probably don't have it in this in this universe, but I imagine it's sort of a uh, police picture after she got in trouble with the law. And they just like stand here and she's like fine, but she pulls the face. I have lost the spell. How do you do? Right. Casting. Focus. Hmm. New weapon. Greetings. Oh, that didn't work. Well, this is odd. My weapon is useless. Greetings. I cannot cast it. This weapon does nothing. Ah, oh, there went the spell. Not working. Shoot. Greetings. Oh, my spell! This isn't working. Need something else. You're in my way. I like violence. But I think I also like was it copy or was it experience? How do you do? Right. Casting. Focus. Hmm. New weapon. Because she's a bit like used to the battle and things like that. Scoot. Skeet. <laughs> yeah, let's go for that. And we will change our name from Natia to. I had a name planned. Can I remember it? Yes, I can. Sylvie. Sylvie Broska. Well, that zoom out made her look super weird to me for a moment. So we've got our attributes that we can change. So we've got strength. Strength measures a character's physical prowess and directly affects the damage the character deals in a physical combat. It also contributes to the accuracy of melee attacks. High strength is essential for warriors, in particular if they wish to wield two-handed weapons and is nearly is critical for rogues. So that's definitely one that we're probably going to put our five points in, but let's have a look at some of the others. Dexterity. Dexterity is the measure of agility, reflexes and balance. Higher dexterity improves a character's chance to hit, makes a character more likely to dodge an incoming blows, makes a character more likely to dodge incoming blows, and contributes to the damage dealt by piercing weapons like daggers or arrows. Archery and dual weapon fighting styles demand high dexterity to master, making this attribute a favourite for rogues. I don't think she's she's going to be interested in archery. She likes getting into the fight, nitty gritty, but we might go dual wielding. I'm not sure yet. Willpower. Willpower represents a character's determination and mental fortitude. With high willpower, a, ma a mage can cast more spells thanks to a deeper mana pool. For warriors and rogues, willpower grants more stamina for combat techniques and special attacks. So that could be useful for us. Magic. Magic is the measure of a character's natural affinity for the arcane. This attribute is crucial for mages since it directly increases a character's spell power score which determines the potency of all spells. The mage attribute also determines how effective potions, poultices and salves are for all classes. So it could be useful, but I imagine that you can just spam potions if you're struggling. Cunning. Cunning determines how well a character learns and reasons. Most skills, such as herbalism, or combat tactics require a quick mind to master and an observant eye can more easily find weaknesses in enemy armour. Rogues benefit most from this statistic as many of their class abilities and special attacks rely on subtlety 
while reading the target not to roll strength. And then finally, constitution. Constitution represents higher resilience. Higher constitution directly increases the amount of damage a character can take before falling on the battlefield. So that's obviously important to all of them. And I can see how the spread is at the moment that strength, dexterity and constitution are the most effective. So as I don't know exactly how I'm going to play her at the moment, what she'll be interested in, we'll, we'll follow that. So we'll put two in strength, two in constitution, and one more in dexterity. And then we've got skills. So we've got two already. Two already, so we've got stealing. Yes. So this character... The is quick enough to pilfer small items from others, whether friendly or hostile, so long as they are not too alert. And Combat training. The character has completed basic combat training. Warriors and rogues gain access to first tier weapon talents. Mages can take more damage from an attack before it interrupts their spell casting. So let's look at the ones we've got once skill point spend so we'll look at some of the others so we will look at coercion the character is influential enough to convince others to change their views strength contributes to a more intimidating character whereas cunning contributes to a more persuasive character trap making the character has learned to conduct basic traps and lures out of common components survival the character can detect the presence of nearby creatures below the character's own level. This skill also grants small bonuses grants a small bonus to nature resistance. Herbalism. The character can make simple potions, poultices and salves from common herbs. Poison making. The character has survived the difficult learning process of making simple potions and and grenades. <laughs> Why is grenades in the poison making? <laughs> That's uh, well, I mean, it doesn't have its own skill. I. That's weird. That's a that's a weird place to put it. It's, it's a very odd addition, I think. So we can also go for improved combat training. Warriors and rogues gain access to second tier weapon talents, as well as a bonus to stamina regeneration. Mages can take more damage from an attack before it interrupts their spellcasting and gain a bonus to mana regeneration. And then we have combat tactics, where the character can formulate strategies quickly in battle and consequently gains a combat tactic slot. Now that one, I think might be useful, but it's been a while. I know tactics is important or isn't important. We'll avoid it for now, but we might take some in it later. Uh, obviously, combat training is also important, but for now, we're going to go for one of the other skills. Trap making. I could see her making traps, but I think she's a more forthright person, so coercion. You know, being a lack in a thug, she's obviously gone out and gone like, you know, you got to give, got to give my boss, you know, whatever he wants or I'll thump you. Or maybe she's nicer about it. I'm not sure yet. But I think we're going to go for the uh, poison making. <laughs> I imagine she went to like this back alley dude to learn it. And this guy was like, you know, he was more expensive than anybody else that she went to for it. And she was like, well, why should I trust? Why, why should I learn from you? And he was like, well, I'll, I'll throw in grenades as well. And she was sold. So we're going to go for poison making. So we also have talents. And we have two, two points to spend. We've got a lot of sections to choose from. We've got, med we've got play styles. So we've got the basic warrior stuff. So we've got uh, powerful. Though training through training and hard work, the warrior has gained greater health and reduced the 
and reduce the fatigue penalty for wearing armour. And precise, precise striking. The warrior tries to make each attack count, sacrificing attack speed for a bonus to attack as well as an increased chance to score more critical hits for as long as this mode is active. So I'm not sure how long it is active. It's sustained, so I imagine it's until you click it off. What was powerful? Powerful was passive, so that's useful. So I don't need to like, worry about it. I've just always got it. I did mention that I might be interested in dual wielding, and I see I've already got a skill on it. So we've got dual wheel, dual weapon sweep. The character sweeps both weapons in a broad forward arc, striking nearby enemies with one or both weapons, and inflicting significantly more damage than normal. And then we've also got dual striking. When in this mode, the character strikes with both weapons simultaneously. Attacks cause more damage, but the character cannot inflict regular critical hits or backstabs. Dual weapon draining, which is once again passive. The character has become more proficient in fighting with two weapons and now deals closer to normal damage bonus with the offhand weapon. So I guess you get a little more damage with that. And I said probably not archery, but we'll read. Maybe we'll see something interesting. Maybe we'll learn later on. Experience fighting in tight quarters has taught the archer to fire without interruption, even when being attacked. And that was melee archer. So we could go melee archer. We're in close quarters. Pinning shot, a shot to the target's legs disables the foes. Pinning the target in place unless it passes a physical resistance check and showing movements and slowing movement speed otherwise. That page shot, speed wins out over power while this mode is active as the archer fires more rapidly but without, without any chance of inflicting regular critical hits. Master Archer increases the rate of fire further still. Which I... Master Archer? Okay. <laughs> I like how it's like Master Archer, you know, you take that skill and that's like all the way down here. So I definitely, if I, we'll see. Weapon and Shield. Shield Bash. The character's shield bashes a target dealing normal damage as well as knocking the target off its feet unless it passes a physical resistance check. Shield Mastery doubles the strength bonus for this attack. Shield Defense While this mode is active, the character drops into a defensive stance that favours the shield, gaining bonus to defense and an increased chance to shrug off missile attacks, but taking a penalty to attack. With Shield Balance, the attack penalty is reduced. With shield expertise, the defense bonus increases. With shield mastery, the defense bonus increases further. And then shield block. Practice fighting with a shield improves the character's guard. Enemies can no longer flank the character on the shield carrying side. We're probably not going to go weapon and shield, at least at first. You know, she's, she's not been in any tough fights. Except, you know, when she was younger and that person dinted her forehead. But, you know, she can take people. So, two-handed, pummel strike. Instead of going for the fatal attack as an enemy expects, the player strikes out with a weapon's blunt end, knocking the opponent to the ground unless it passes a physical resistance check. Oh, we might have to go for this one. I've said, I've said that she likes hitting people in the head and that's exactly what this is. Just blunt side of the weapon, that's just being very, very petty, and I'm all for that. And then Sunder Arms, which we don't have quite enough strength, but I think we did reach 18 strength, so we could get this in a couple of levels. Sunder Arms, the character attempts to hinder a target's ability to fight back rather than going directly for a killing blow. Unless the target passes a physical resistance check, it suffers a penalty to attack for a short time. And then Mighty Blow. The character puts extra weight and effort behind a single strike, 
gaining a bonus to attack. If it hits, the blow deals critical damage and imposes a penalty to movement speed unless the target passes a physical resistance check. So yeah, we, we are going for the pommel strike. <laughs> We're going to hit people in the head and hopefully knock them to the ground. We'll need to like pay attention to see how many times it, uh, how many they, I mean, how many times they suffer a penalty to attack, if it even shows us. And then we've got, I think I'm going to go for the powerful one because it's a passive, and I think this uh, this affects whatever we go for so we'll you know we'll be safe for that it'll be useful okay so that is that is the last bit time to play difficulty we've got easy normal hard or nightmare we are of course going for nightmare you know because because what else would we go for you know you you guys should trust me that I will of course pick Nightmare, you know. Everybody close their eyes for about 10 seconds while I click uh, a Nightmare. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I'm not going Nightmare. I will die so many times. And you don't know how much I want to actually go easy, but we'll, we'll take the middle road and we'll go normal. <laughs> let's, let's play. Let's begin our adventure. Deep beneath the Frostback Mountains sits Orzammar, largest and proudest of the two remaining Dwarven cities. Once the seat of an underground empire, Orzammar now stands alone, cut off from the world by the Darkspawn, still clinging to the memory of its former glory. Below the vast statues and gilded halls where the noble families play at politics, the lower castes live in their shadows, scurrying to serve like their ancestors before them. Below that is you. You are Cascus, the dirty secret staining Orzammar's perfect society, forced, along with your sister, to sell your services to the crime lord Barat. To the rest of Orzammar, you are proof that the castless deserve their fate. But you know you do what you have to, the same as everyone just to survive. I can't keep gambling on you forever, precious. You've got a sweet look, something to light a man on fire. But you gotta make it count. Please, Barat. I don't want to do this in front of my sister. Why not? She knows the slope of the land, don't you, girl? Well, we've met him, like, for 30 seconds, and we already know that he's not a good guy. Do we like him? Heck no, he's an he's an a hole. We owe you everything for that. We won't let you down. <laughs> Don't worry, she'll find a man or she'll answer to me. No, we we love our sister, so you know. Didn't I tell you not to talk that way to my sister? You told me a lot of things, not one of which meant more than a fart in the middens. Before me, your sister was just another duster. Now check her out. Braids down to here, gold cap teeth. She can recite elf poetry and play the string harp. Every man's dream. All she's got to do is find a lord, squeeze out some kid who looks like him, and we're all living the easy life in the diamond war. Please, don't get involved. You know that never goes well. I love how he says... It's get a kid that looks like him which implies that it doesn't actually have to be that lord's kid which i guess is true as long as it looks like him because i doubt they've got dna but maybe magic could do something then again dwarves wouldn't know much about magic would they so uh he's right whatever it takes to get out of the cesspool we're not going to agree with him even though we're going to be trying to be nice to him so you know, I don't like to see him treat me that way. I'll treat her however I like, as long as you both eat off my plate. You keep your head down and say I 
to any job I decide is low enough for scum like you. In return, I put out coins so you can doll yourself up and get a belly full of some nobleman's brats. Then you both go free, and I get to join the family and be called my lord for the rest of the little prince's while. And I said I'll call you uncle and come visit on main days. No, we're already annoying him, so let's not let's not have him stab us now. We've kept our part of the deal. Well, he's just implied we haven't, so that will just anger him. So what are you doing here? Let's just get straight to the point. Checking on my investments. And right now, they don't bear much gold. I'm giving you another week, precious. If you haven't found a patron, you're back to sweeping streets. But I have. I've met someone. That is, I didn't want to promise, but he seemed interested. See, she found someone. Watch yourself for that. We might not need you pretty soon. Well, that is completely true. And it's probably what we are planning. We're not going to give him, like... We're not going to give him the knowledge that we're planning that. <laughs> you know, that we're planning to backstab him. So, you know, get off her back. Get off her back and tell me my job for today. Your buddy Lesky's waiting outside. He knows what I'll need from you today. Don't even think about bungling this job. Your whole family's on loose sand with me right now. And I know you don't have anywhere else to turn. I'm sorry you had to see that. <laughs> I've seen it before and I'll see it again. Well, that's true. We're going to be a bit nicer to her because it seems like she's having a bad day. So, you know, you don't have to hide anything from me, Rika. I've always tried, though. At least I've kept you from buying your future with what's between your legs. I should have told you. Barad's been warning me ever since two of his other girls found patrons at Lord Harrowmont's reception. They've been getting gifts already. Lord Rooston gave Elsie a surface silk gown and she's not even pregnant. Barad's getting impatient. That makes me think that she's probably the older sister then. Which fits with what I think. And the bratty younger sister, who would also, like, fight a man to the death for, you know, Rika. Speaking of the man, probably Barat. <laughs> I just wish he didn't have to kiss up to that cave tick. You know the other options. Cleaning middens, begging, going to the surface. No. Unless you find a way to save us all from Darkspawn and become a paragon. We're pretty much on Barat's leash for life. Else. I like how we can just end the conversation now. I need to get going. Goodbye. Now let's let's talk to her a little more. We we want to avoid his job for as much as possible because I imagine none of those jobs are good. So I don't know why I can't fight the army and fight Dark Spawn. It's sheer folly. One more way the nobles protect their status. They say castless soldiers are more danger to each other than to Darkspawn. That it's an insult to the smith to let us touch a fine-made weapon. Truly, they just don't wish to insult the warrior caste by showing that given the same opportunities, we could lead an army just as well. <laughs> I like how we just, we just plan vengeance for everybody. With, they'd know we'd turn our weapons on them if we had any. They'd rather we all be killed than admit they're wrong. But... Haven't the dark spawn almost ever in the current troops? I think that's what it said in the cutscene earlier. Every year, more of the beasts come up from the deep roads. I've heard they've even been harrying the surface. <laughs> that's just there every time. It's like, like that's like a weird place to even end the conversation. Is anyone doing anything about it? Aye, they would even turn to humans for aid before us. It seems. There's been talk of an alliance against the Darkspawn. Even that the Grey Wardens have stepped up. But we don't have time for this now. Lesky must be waiting. And Barat won't like it if I'm late for my appointment. Eh. Uh, screw that cave tick. It's not fair that he gets pushes around. Did I already say that one? 
He expects too much from you. You know how desperate the nobles are for more children? They can barely field enough soldiers to hold the walls against the Darkspawn. If I could give one of them a son, the whole house would celebrate. And we'd all be raised up to noble caste to join the family. That's why Barat's batting all. That's why he paid for my course, my voice lessons. He wants to share the reward. I believe you said that there was a noble who was interested in you? Yes. That is, I hope. He certainly seems charming. He treats me like a real lady. Not just someone to tumble and forget. Ew, I don't want to think about my sister doing that. Gross. <laughs> it's not entirely unpleasant, but I hope you only find that out with someone you truly love. Aww. Money gives him power. He's got family on Astartes, which means he can smuggle up lyrium and smithcrafts, and bring down silks, wines, and furs. And he played it smart. When he started expanding, he made sure it was only the castless he shook down for protection, so the guardsmen didn't care. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't said that one, so... <laughs> Why are we talking about that? <laughs> I really don't care. And now he has everything a dwarf could want. I hope there's more you want in life than to be some copper-plated crime lord. I was being sarcastic. You still got the chance to get out of here. Dream big. Be a paragon. Don't stop at becoming another Varat. I imagine that she did know that was being sarcastic, but she's on edge and she really doesn't like him and she doesn't want to even think about me becoming a Varat. But... I think that's the second time we have been mentioned as becoming a paragon, so someone like me could never actually be a paragon. It wouldn't be the first time. Garalon the Blood Risen was born castless, you know, before he went to the surface. And he came back and won the throne. Many paragons have humble origins. All that matters is that the assembly recognizes their achievements. And once they get that vote, they found their own house. And they're as noble as if the ancestors themselves had made it so. I don't know whether she actually believes this or she's delusional, but I've got one fuzzy thinking that Rika thinks that I could actually be a paragon. So, imagine founding our own house. So what are you standing around here for? Go do something great. That would certainly surprise Mother. Oh, don't pay attention to her. She's just a bitter old drunk. She also said you'd never learn to walk or stop dumping in the bed. Make something of yourself just to spite her. Did she say dumping or jumping? Because I wasn't looking at... What? Okay, maybe I will at that. I think... Maybe you will. But until then, <laughs> we can only serve as Barat demands. And he won't like it if either of us is late. Either way, I'm highly embarrassed by the turn that conversation took, so you're right. Goodbye. Stay out of trouble. I'll see you tonight. <laughs> Seriously, I don't know what... Dumping or jumping? Who knows? <laughs> but anyway, I think I think this is where we'll, we'll pause things for now. We've created the character that we're going to follow through the game. We've got the lovely Sylvie Broska. And for all that talk about Paragons, I'm sure that we will never leave Orzammar or be given the chance to go on a life-changing adventure. <laughs> you know, Rika's pretty funny thinking that we could ever become a Paragon. Although, you know, Sylvie's be totally cool enough to do it. <laughs> so next time, I guess we'll finally get around to... You know that job that that cave dick has for us? Well, you know, we'll explore our, uh, our house. We'll find something to do. But uh, before I go, I'll leave you guys with a question. Those of you who've played this game before, at least. What is your favourite origin? And what is your least favourite origin? For me, I think my favourite one is the City Elf. 
I feel like, you know, it's the most interesting premise. And I feel like, um, like I said other, earlier, I really love an underdog. So I love playing the underdog story. And it's just, it's something that you never really think about with elves. You never really think that they could become, you know, slaves. They're always the the people in the trees. So the Dalish are probably more, more alike to what elves and popular fiction are like. But even then, the Dalish are a little bit different as well. So at least, you know, the city elf is my favourite. And my least favourite is human noble, probably. I think it's... You know, it's not because it's a bad story. I think it's a pretty good story. And it gives you great motivation for a lot of the rest of the game. You know, it gets you pumped up to play. But I find it's the most stereotypical. And there's only ever one reason why I choose to play a human noble. Specifically female, but I guess you could play it to be female as well. So I'm really interested in what you guys think what your favourites and least favourites are and why. So thank you for watching and I hope you'll join me in the next episode of Dragon Age Origins, the brand new 2022 game. Oh. And I'll see you soon.